bit of irony in the morning just to see an old product kind of jump into my life. But anyways, um, my name is Kelly Richard Fennig. I am a, was a consultant with the National Film Board of Canada. And I was the project director and designer for a project which we like to call Circa 1948. So thank you for coming here this morning. I realize it's early. I realize it's off the beaten path and off the beaten track, no pun intended. So um, yeah, this is basically how to use the tools that we already know in the conventions to make non-games for non-gamers. So there's some terms there that are probably somewhat new. So what's really a non-game? I'm talking about interactive art and interactive storytelling. This is making an experience for the other 80%. There's about 20% that are probably gamers, and the other 80% are like your moms, your grandmothers. People who just bought a tablet, but they appreciate experiences, they don't want it, some things. So I'll be uh, going through some definitions of what these are. A non-game is using the game frameworks to engage an audience and tell a story and have an experience. So for the, the context of this uh, talk, I'll be talking about the Circa app that we worked on. It's an interactive storytelling iOS app, which is a first-person exploration through historic Vancouver set in 1948. It was designed using an open source engine called Kraken. We also use Maya to create all the assets. So all the backgrounds you see are, are actual screen grabs from the iOS app. And it, the story was told in multiple levels. There were audio story told in a non-linear fashion. They'll find these little, um, little radio plays that they'll stumble upon. As well, the environment is the real star. Because the artist we were working with is Stan Douglas. He's a photo compositor. So he'll take a bunch of different elements in kind of a dilapidated world and create this perfect photo. So it gives the people the experience and a chance to step into a Stan Douglas photograph. So by combining the audio and the environment together, we do something that's known as re recombinant storytelling. So people will encounter the audio and the story in their own way, and they get to create the story. They become part of the art because it's their experience that matters. And this is also part of a greater project, which is uh, there was a screen uh, or a, a, a live stage play called Helen Lawrence that was using some of the assets. There's a web page, a photo exhibit, a series of lectures. We were at the Tribeca Film Festival. So this is the central part of a larger art narrative. So how does interactive art differ from a game? Now this is the key thing that really is kind of the crux of this talk is about. First, there's minimal to no rules in art. Um, it's more subject to free will, so you must design to the impact of free will and understand what, how is that going to affect their experience. And so you can't penalize them for having their own experience. And that's a big thing here, otherwise they get frustrated. And there's no risk or reward loops either. The only currency they're investing in there is their time. So you have to make sure that that is a wise investment and you want to be able to reward them for their time. And lastly, there's no frustration. Games will have challenges. Art should have none. Unless your frustrations is going to be part of the art. But make sure that's kind of upfront. Be honest with them. So there's no wrong way to experience art. And the only way you can do is they can either like it or not like it. And hopefully when they like it, it's not be, uh, or if they don't like it, it's not because of our design. It's just because they have, it's just now their own preferential choice of their experience. So what's a non-gamer? So really, the non-gamer is that 80%, people who don't play games. Now there's a great quote, art without audience consideration is artist masturbation. This is from Frank Zappa. So always consider who your uh, audience is. So you want to ask yourself, how would you describe the personality? What is their motivation for uh, experiencing this? What's their prior experience to games, if any? What controls are they familiar with? What is the purpose of the experience you want them to have? And then how do you get them to see, discover, and appreciate the art that you have created with your artist? It's always good to kind of give your user a face and a name. So let's give it a face. Let's give it a name, Arlene. I can't call her that. I will call her my mom. <laughs> So what is about my mom? I would describe my personality. Even though I design video games and I'm an engineer, uh, she's a Luddite. She's never really experienced technology at all, but she does enjoy theater plays, art, uh, historical things. She's curious. She wants to discover. What's their motivation? Well, besides trying to play a game of mine, she wants to create. She wants to kind of be immersed into an experience that is outside of her own. What is her prior experience to games? Board games, card games. Uh, Sudoku, those sorts of things. Maybe a little bit of Candy Crush. Uh, what's the purpose of the experience for her? This is for her to kind of create and to delve into things, to, to um, step into a stand on this photograph. She's a big fan. Um, so it's understanding those things. What controls are they familiar? Is she familiar with? Well, I just got her an iPad. 
So she basically knows she can just get around on an iPad. You give her a joystick or a game controller, she's lost. So the rest of the talk will be about how to see, discover, and appreciate what the art we've created. That's the remainder of this talk. So how we design for games, games for non-gamers. The first thing we did is we got them in quickly, then we slowed them down. Great quote from a friend of mine, you don't run through the Louvre. Then you give them intuitive controls so they can be immersed into the experience. Then we want to use minimal text and simple menus. And then uh, we gamified our design using tools, uh, using the tools that we already use wisely. So most of the stuff in this talk I'm going to talk about is not new. This is not rocket science. It's all stuff that we've done before. It's just now how do we apply it to the other 80%. So using visual aids, audio aids, and then dummy proofing your design. And then you want to anticipate the unexpected human condition. Um, I gave a talk last year uh, about how to design games for kids uh, just by watching them play. So this is exactly like, it's like the, the, the next step of that, that lecture. It's exactly like designing for children. But these people are less patient, more easily distracted, and more easily frustrated. So keep that in mind. You're really designing for giant kids. And you're reminding them how to play. Their patient span is this much. So we got them in really quick. This is the main menu flow. Um, from what I learned from Casual Connect last year, um, you want to get them in very quick for quick retention. So we, we had a goal from the start of app to in the world actually playing within less than 45 seconds. This includes load screens, this includes all the menus and button presses and selections they have to do. So if you get them playing quick, you get them retained. So we minimize the button presses, one to two at most. We have a main menu, which is the location selection, and then if they come back to the experience, we gave them a new and resume. That's it. No complex menus, and they were very simple menus too. That is our main menu. So basically the button size is large. It's literally half the screen. That half and that half. Um, so the buttons are actually invisible and integrated into the experience. When they look at it, they'll go, okay, I don't know what to do. I'm going to press the screen. Something happens. It conditions them. And this is also, the, um, it was dual usage. It was for location selection to get them into the experience. But it's also, if you notice, it's got some writing on there. This is the most exp um, exposition we have in the whole project. Because again, if they're reading, they're not doing. And I'll get to this later on. So we use this for tracking their progress and um, just to give them some general background in the front end. So once they're in, no more. So to get them immersed, we want to make sure that the controls were intuitive. We tried some conventional gaming controls before. You know, a tap to move, kind of like the game horn, if you're familiar with that. Um, but many reviews express a dislike for this scheme, including our own reviewers, and actually uh, from Wired. Uh, Rigney has a great article about why it is a terrible control scheme, if you get a chance, read it. As well, we had some dual virtual joysticks in the corner. But again, that is uh, way too gamey, and it's also not immediately intuitive. Like I said, if, you gave my grand if I gave my mother a game controller, she would not know to use one thumbstick to move and one thumbstick to look. It's very, it's not intuitive. So think about what the, yeah, think about the user. We had two different modes. The first was what we call viewport. It's basically you use the gyro of the camera and you use one finger because you only usually have one finger, your thumb, available. So you can move the camera around with your hands to look at the world and then slide your thumb to go forward and then tap to select. This is good for about a minute, um, but it's towering over time. Jesse Schell in his lecture last year, he totally mentioned you can do this and then eventually they're looking at the floor. <laughs> So, we, the, our default mode is what we call gesture mode, which was now using one finger swipe to look, two fingers to move, one finger to select. And this is a common convention that's used in the device. They use the two fingers for sliding through menus. They use one finger usually for panning around things like Google Maps. So these are intuitive gestures they already know from the device. And then the tablet can also be oriented in any position. They could be sitting, they could be in the bathtub, they could be on the bus. And they don't have to worry about uh, now the position. So you want to get them going, so we need a basic game loop. Everything even in life has, is a, has one basic loop. You live, you die. You experience stuff. So in this one, explore locations, find an object that triggers a story, listen and watch the story or not, rinse and repeat. And that's it. Nothing complex, very simple. We want them to have their own experience. So we don't have to go into complex loops and have different things and different challenges to go through. Just one loop. And they were happy. So we would teach them often. If you notice, this is the background of the tutorial. So we would actually have instructions limited to one stream. 
which was just the experience instructions, listen carefully and find your way, use drop on 44 lost conversations, and then the controls. And we use iconography as much as possible. From my last lecture and from this one, it's proven, I, I can believe it now after going through a couple games. Just because they can read doesn't mean they want to read. They'll always rely on icons, so, tr so try and minimize your text. Don't try and, if you can explain it with iconography, do it. So we would show this tutorial screen on the very first usage and then uh, with every time they change the control scheme. And then it's a tap to dismiss. Simple. No close buttons, nothing. Just tap to dismiss. Now, uh, when we simplified their experience, we, did, uh, we had a minimal menu. This little uh, circle in the corner there, that brought them into the menu. It was singular and non-intrusive. So we didn't have multi-layered uh, menus. And it wasn't to distract them from the immersion, from the star of the, of the app, which was the environment. And we used the four button ribbon. We stole this from Rovio. It works. So we had location selection. Again, it was the most used button, so we put it first. And that gave you also your exposition and your progress tracking. Input control scheme, and it was a toggle, so you're either switching between the viewport or the gesture. And also brought up the help screen. Credits, because this is with the National Film Board, and everyone wants the credits. Everyone wants to see their name. It's with a 2%, well, actually, the less than 1% percent will press it. And then lastly, additional help and info. And this will send them to a web page. This was really important because we want to move all the exposition off the app. That way it kept them immersed. If they were to leave the app, then they're taking themselves into more of a reading mode and less of a playing mode. Um, that way also your web page can be, um, can be updated if you need to change the content. It, you don't have to do an, an update of the actual app itself. The other thing you can do is you can consider actually a companion app like Yearwalk. Brilliant thing I saw last year with Yearwalk where they would have a separate app which has all the exposition but it's also dual, uh, it's a free app, it's, it's uh, dual discovery inside the app store. Really good marketing, really good way of actually having two different experiences and marrying them together. And then all the buttons are one level deep. You basically press the button, that button in the corner there, and it brings up the ribbon, and all of, they're all one button to dismiss, and that's it. And then you want to subtly guide them to the cool stuff. So, free will sucks the proverbial big one, but it does come with the territory, so you have to adjust it. <laughs> So, you want to rely on the senses, their sight and their sound. Those are the tools, again, these are things that we've already used for level design, if you've done any first person shooters. Um, so you want to herd them to the more interesting places. We use lights. Um, we made some, some very well laid areas. When you use light bulbs, also as point flares, it's kind of a trail of breadcrumbs to lead them to the places. The places that were darker were less interesting. They get that through, through shaping and conditioning. Uh, we used audio. We had sparse ambient, ambient tracks in the places that were also less interesting and more diverse sounds and more complex sounds in the areas that were more. Use reverb if you can. Use any audio tools you've got. Also, we had audio clues to lead them to active story areas, so very specific key um, audio tones, which I'll get to later, as well as highlight the objects to show that they, trigger the, uh, that they trigger the stories. You have to at least tell them, touch here, don't touch here. That stuff is still generic, and it doesn't distract from the art at all. This leads to cause and effect. We had, um, within this open world that we created, we had 15 specific locations with multiple stories per location. We wanted to limit to only one story per location at a given time because we didn't want to have them go through and be overwhelmed. But at the same time, we want to have make sure everyone had a unique experience. So your story is different from yours, which is different from yours because you encounter the stories in different orders. So we would use the stimulus to draw them in. We'd use audio cues, very specific sounds to bring them in. Um, that would, uh, again, that may be significant above the story they're about to hear. It's above the ambient mix. We would have glowing shader on the object for them to interact with. Again, curiosity will get them. They'll see something glowing. They will want to touch it. So let them. This, they'll manually trigger the scene so they don't accidentally uh, trigger it before they had actually uh, proximity based. And people would be walking by the object. The scene would start and they would walk away not realizing that they're going to be missing out some content. They don't know to stay. So um, this is the only gaming element of the whole app, was this just basically the tapping a shader. And then you provide the feedback. You would change color with, to show that it's actually been interacted with, and then uh, have it come down. What's my time left? Uh, you have like five minutes? No problem. Sight and storytelling. So what we ended up doing is that um, we have binaural audio. <coughs> So we made sure that we actually had some characters that moved around the, the, the screen so people know what to track with. We animated some sprite clouds. Without them, it's hard to tell what to look at, the scene it started, where to talk with. And animating them would be an extra dimension to the performance. But it was simple animations. Just lurping them around was enough for them to enjoy it. 
the biggest challenge was to get the artist to actually buy into it, so we had to make sure that these little sprites did not distract from the story. Now, the, the artist had made the suggestion of saying, why don't we just put everything in, make everything available at once and let the user choose. The result of this is that they would um, do everything in one area, then they'd move on, and they'd never come back to that area again. And it posed two problems for us. One, it subconsciously limits the freedom of choice, and it affects the order of what they do and really limits that recombinant narrative that the artist wanted. And it also conditions people to rush through, only looking for those highlighted objects and not looking at the whole world in itself. So in theory, the artist's suggestion was promoting game mentality. So what we did instead is we controlled the free will. We only limited one story to each location by using the cues. And if they chose to, um, if they selected something and they didn't want to see that scene, they could walk away. We could time it out for a short time or turn it off completely, bring up all the stories and let them choose something else. They can come back to it later. And then we would use the visual aids for when they should move on. The audio will go down, the, the, the actors will fade out, and then the, uh, the ambient audio will come back up. And there will also be a little hotel ding at the end, just to let them know, okay, it's done, now I can move on. The last thing you want to do is minimize the frustration. You want to pad the walls. So most of the time, they're going to have a lot of the frustration will be with the movement, and it's because they're not used to it. So what you want to do is assume that they suck at moving, and focus on your collision detection. What we ended up doing is we did some, uh, we actually used our handshake uh, colliders to create obtuse angles, so they could always run along the wall and never get stuck at a point. The other thing you could probably think about as a more elegant solution would be using a nav mesh. So those of you who, don't, who know what it is, great. If you don't, talk to your engineers. So what is it? the last thing is the trade-offs. What is acceptable to non-gamers? This is, again, the frustration model. Things that gamers don't like and tolerate, it's even more critical to, to think about that for the non-gamers. Because gamers are willing to suffer. I think we kind of say this. But non-gamers are more easily frustrated. And if they're frustrated, they're taking out the experience. So for some technical things to keep in mind, Keep in mind your load times, that the controls must be incredibly responsive. Um, think about LD and texture popping. And level detail must be consistent. It must be consistently crappy, but as long as it's even. If they start seeing some things are sharper than others, they get taken out very easily. And so they want to have a uniform experience from one playthrough to from the other. So it's, they, they, don't, they want to keep their expectations the same. So what was the payoff for doing all this work? Um, we pushed the limits of the Apple hardware. It was uh, pushing the limits on the iPad Air. Uh, we have 2K textures in this world. And if you see from the background, they're very detailed. Um, because of that, we were featured by the, uh, Apple in the App Store for multiple months. I think we might still be, but we're dead in Canada for sure. But we were on the front page of, the, uh, of some of the arts and photography and also on the front page in general. Um, we were featured by Time Magazine and McLean's. We also we were showcased at the Tribeca Film Festival. We put it actually in this immersive room, which I could talk about later. But that was a totally different experience. But um, to gamers, it was a simplistic game, yeah. But they aren't our core audience, so we didn't care. We cared about the other 80%. The core audience, this is probably their first time to ever use something like this. And they thought it was immersive and addicting. My mom, you know, again, thank you, mom. Um, and she doesn't play my games, but she played this. Um, I look at this as a gateway experience for similar games. These, these designing interactive storytelling is like creating, um, it's for the people who play Skyrim but don't want to kill people. They want people who want to drive around Grand Theft Auto 4 because they want to drive through a virtual New York and see some of the people but not have to shoot at people, you know. Um, they don't want the violence, they just want the experience. And there's a huge market for this. Year Walk, Gone Home, Stanley Parable, um, it's just growing. It's the reason why I got into here. I grew up uh, playing Sierra online games and that was just about adventure. And this is what, it, it's, um, this is going to be a huge audience, especially on the tablet. I'm a firm believer that this is going to be the, the, the future of gaming. So remember, we're not make, we don't have to just make games. We can make interactive art using the tools we've got. And I'm really excited for, for the future with the tablets now. Um, if you want to learn more about the project, you can download the app for free. Again, it's paid with taxpayers' dollars, so it's, um, it's available in the US and Apple Store. You can use that uh, QR code if you want to download it. Um, you can see the web page. Sorry, it's all so bright, but it's basically um, there's a web page, circa1948.nfb.ca, to see some of the details behind it. Um, I'll have an interview in GameSauce talking about the postmortem of it, as well if you're interested about the Kraken engine, <coughs> it's there. Um, yeah, that really is crappy way of looking at it. You can't read any of that, can you? Um, my email's up there, my LinkedIn's up there, you're not going to be able to read that. Uh, no, and same thing with uh, my Twitter. Also, um, if you liked what I was talking about and the way I think, I've got a bunch of friends who uh, I'm together with. We formed a ton of interactive. 
we're doing some kind of cool things. Um, you can always talk with us. Uh, a friend and partner over here is around as well, too. So you can check us out. My name's Kelly. Hopefully you guys are going to start doing some interactive storytelling and not just make games, but consider making art. Thank you.